Hey guys, what's up? Aru. Since Natlan is only two patches away and I keep getting these artifacts over and over, I might as well talk about the lore of Unfinished Reverie and how it's where the long lost civilization of Celestia is actually located. Uh, again, that said, the heroic story of this artifact set will help us find implications to Natlan's culture, people, as well as the parts of Genshin's history that may have been connected to Natlan's secret that could be related to the Primordial One's ancient civilization or the root cycle that is Natlantian. This is an extension of what we already know about Natlan as it's from the most recent edition of Lore. As always, timestamps will be down in the description for any specific segments that you want to watch first. Let's get started. Starting with the Flower of Unfinished Reverie, the main focus of this artifact set is of the heroic tale of a scarlet-eyed youth who came from a city or kingdom of light and water, likely Celestia or Remoria in this context. But it's also stated that he came from the Sacred Flames, possibly hinting at the primal fire of which Polanka was sealed in from Nouvellet's drip marketing post. His mission seemingly between reigniting the authority of the tribes as well as fending off the ancient gloom, which sounds like the dark mud of the abyss but in Natlan. Interestingly, an old woman would warn him of the almost fate-like events that would come to him and his friends in the future, almost like she knows what's coming, a possible nod to the Hexen Circle's end, of which she's closely related to the most recent edition of the Imaginarium Theater. Now the word ineffable means indescribable, and a city would either have designs so magnificent and mystical or extraordinarily beautiful that it can't be described. One such example could be the root cycles studied in the Narcissus and Kreutz Ordo. Hyperborea, Remoria, Conria, and possibly Natlantian's ineffable city. The characters mentioned are a half-man who was playing with preeminence, a young girl named Sakuk characterized by a Quetzal, the hero twins Atawalpa the Elder and Waskar the Younger, and the taciturn silent warrior Yupanqui. Quetzal birds are a prominent symbol in Mesoamerican culture, symbolizing freedom and spirituality with its long green feathers, as well as being divine messengers of the gods which is greatly reflected through the girl and her Quetzal feather. It's also associated with the feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl, a dragon that may have existed prior to the events that led to the unfinished reverie set, which could point to the time of the dragon lords. It could also be related to Sakuk's father, who held the Saurians of the likely six tribes. The hero twins Atawalpa and Waskar reflect what has been theorized before as the Mayan hero twins Shbalanka and Hunapu. Atawalpa is likely named after the Incan emperor Atahualpa, meaning lucky or fortunate rooster. Atahualpa was the last Incan emperor before being captured and executed during the Spanish Inquisition. This could mean that Natlan at the time of the artifact set was facing a sort of colonization or conflict with other regions or from a different god king a tyrant from another world, which can be evident from Waskar or Huskar with his lashes. The name Huskar can mean chain or rope, named after his birthplace Huascaparta, roughly meaning an agricultural chain terrace in Quechua language. Now these two were actually half-brothers and fought in a civil war, but in Genshin they are twin brothers with Huskar bearing the lash of the tyrant that likely once ruled a kingdom where they were in, hinting at Natlan possibly being ruled by a tyrant long ago, similar to what happened with the Caribbean, Gurabad, Remoria, and possibly right now, Natlantian. Currently, the pseudo-ruler of the ineffable city was only a half-man playing with preeminence, hinting that a different war happened before that left it with dusty banners and firm warnings against messengers of twilight and ancient beings. Now, the only wars that could have happened long ago at this time period are likely between the Dragon Lords and the Primordial One, the war with the Second One, the fall of the Sili Era, and the Archon War with the events in the Cataclysm being the least likely to happen, leaving a would-be half-man as heir to the throne, a child too young to rule like Enkanomiya's son children, a human mixed with a beast or saurian, or a half-human half-god from Celestia, a descendant of a god-king perhaps. It's worth mentioning that the half-man isn't explicitly mentioned as the tyrant of the city just yet, but the half-man was playing with preeminence, suggesting naivety, arrogance, being manipulated or is manipulating his authority as well as inexperience. Lastly, Yupan Kui, the silent warrior, meaning you shall reckon or you will count. His name is likely inspired by Tupac Yupan Kui. Although not contemporaneously related, his name and origins could be related to Tupac Amar. 
Amaru, which was known for resisting the Spanish Inquisition during the years 1545 and 1572. Now, this is almost a hundred years after Tupac Yupan Kui, who expanded the borders of the Inca Empire in 1441 and 1493. Now, I don't really know if they were related by blood, but it's cool that their names and their lifetimes line up with Genshin's timeline, and they could have been blood related in game 2. Moving on, the feather summarizes finding someone who knows the lay of the city, the disheveled craftsman who knew of the turquoise carvings of the hero youth, and the backstory of the Quetzal girl Sakuk and her father. The craftsman himself was likely from a similar time period between the ancient civilization all the way to before the Archon War after the Dragon Lord's defeat, who also suffered from the tyrant's erratic rule, similar to Remus's rule, which was right after Egeria being sealed in the Primordial Sea. Now, turquoise and quetzal birds hold significant meanings for Mesoamerican and African cultures, such as turquoise stones for divinity and the color that is reserved for the gods. Adornment for both warriors and decorative wards, as well as wealth and status for those with such colored trinkets. And there's also its association with the feathered serpent Quetzalcoatl. Now, Quetzals and Quetzalcoatl symbolizes the wind instead of fire, reflecting Sakuk's guidance and being a messenger for the heroes. Sakuk's father, who would have had a turquoise inlaid Quetzal feather made by the craftsman, would also fit this role of a guide, highlighting her possible noble origins and the primordial era of Quetzal bird humans as divine messengers during the reign of humanity over Saurians. African spiritual insight can also be highlighted here as the interaction between the girl and the craftsman was all from their intuition. Finally, Quetzal feathers symbolize rebirth from the fall of an empire rising again through the young girl and the craftsman's fire for vengeance. Sekuk's father, who was likely a divine messenger, was also condemned for helping the Saurians, meaning he betrayed a law or a possible principle of Celestia of helping the Saurians. Similar to Kuntur's father, who was punished with blinding golden arrows from the sun, possibly from helping the chained and shackled Saurians during that time. Mesoamerican culture often call kings as the closest to the sun and the sun gods, being representatives of the divines, hence being rained golden arrows from the sun. So an erratic tyrant calling themselves a representative of the sun, or even straight up calling himself the actual sun, meaning god, and manipulating his reign is very possible. Moving on to the moment of attainment, it's where people from different landscapes came together to help the band of heroes. Interestingly, six locations or tribes rose against the ineffable city, likely where the preeminent half-man and tyrant ruled. This is either the six other regions led by the hero from the Sacred Flame coming to either overthrow the rule of a divine tyrant in Natlan, or the six tribes' as different elements and the hero youth with his divine fiery wrath overthrowing the insane tyrant's empty throne. Interestingly, Sakuk, which was the revealed true name of the Quetzal girl, acted on behalf of all six tribe leaders, implying that there aren't any leaders of the six tribes. Now, if we take a look at the talking stick, Tanak and the six companions fighting to create the Mare Jivari could have happened before this event. Maybe the six companions died to create the Mare Jivari, which was then likely where the scarlet-eyed youth would have came from, the sacred flames. The ancient gloom that likely made the hero youth emerge from the flames with his mission also seems like a recurring phenomenon of the abyss and forbidden knowledge in Natlan, which is probably the reason for the constant war. A dark shadow that covered the sun was also mentioned by the craftsmen, hinting at not only the possible relations with Conria's Eclipse Dynasty, but also of Mesoamerican and African cultures regarding eclipses symbolizing divine conflicts, moments of crisis, rituals for divine order, or cosmic harmony, among other things. This could also hint that Tevat also experienced a period of eclipses, or that the craftsmen, similar to Perrin Harry and Arlecchino, experienced the same transition of the moons in the abyss, or that we had a similar vision after seeing Remus in Remoria, a secret that is only known to their people. The quote-unquote Saurian was also freed from its shackles, 
Now, whether or not it focuses entirely on the Saurian race or a specific Saurian like, say, the Pyro Sovereign Saurian is up to speculation. But freeing the Saurian could also be symbolic of returning the Pyro Authority to all six tribes. A moment in time when all the tribes unified and attained their freedom, hence the moment of attainment. It's worth noting that the Ineffable City was now corroded, which reflects the dark mud from King Deshret's rule in Sumeru with forbidden knowledge. Leading us to the history of the Ineffable city and the gathering where this entire plan was made and decided. The Goblet piece specifically speaks of the craftsman's life during the rule of the Tyrant King. He speaks of machine beasts that could fly, as well as the depths of secrets that the king had ordered them to excavate, likely similar to what happened in the Chasm, where the miners of that time uncovered the upside-down city along with its secrets, which if you could remember led to the events of the Lone Yaksha, Osatius and the Millilith being trapped and falling in the Chasm's bed with their fantastic compass. In Natlan's case, the king found the secrets of the depths, and in his realization, he burned the city and sealed that part of his kingdom behind a stone gate. Now, stone cities are a common architecture in Mesoamerican and African culture, from Mayan, Aztec, and Inca stonework and architecture, to Ethiopian, Zimbabwe, and Mali, and many other parts of Africa also include stone architecture. Places like the Puerta del Sol or the Great Zimbabwe Complex are only some examples of stone gates and stone structures, often symbolizing access to divine realms, the underground realm, as well as ceremonial points. Now, this gate is likely located in the now corroded and and now ashen area that was once in the ineffable city in Natlan, and is a testament to the stone's long-lasting mark and endurance against corrosion or erosion, in Genshin's case, a known fact in Genshin lore from our geo-friend Zong Li. Moving on, a stupor-like vision that the craftsman saw is similar to what we found in Remuria, but instead of a kingdom that fell for a dream, it was a kingdom that fell for the abyss. Gold flowing patterns, gigantic beasts and whirring machines, and shadows driven by flowing flames that climbed to the disk of the moon, as well as an old empire that stretched far and wide, old enough that even the heroes wouldn't know about. Again, recounting possible events of Natlan during the ancient civilization's rule after the Dragon Lord's defeat. Gold tears like the forbidden knowledge in the craftsman's eye is also symbolic of divine revelations, as gold is regarded as a sacred material in Mesoamerican culture, and within Genshin a material that's often related to forbidden knowledge quite recently. The wine flask itself is also symbolic of Natlan's love for gathering together as well as sharing each other's stories. But some stories sadly were never told, because after enacting their plan, their fate would also be sealed. The Crownless Crown Crafted by the young girl for the supposed new king for the new era that they had created. Crowns in African and Mesoamerican culture are symbols of royal authority as well as divine right. In Genshin's case, divine authority. Priests and divine envoys would wear these during rituals as well as being symbols of their status. Something that Sakuk's father likely and theoretically wore as a Quetzal messenger for the divines. Sadly, after the fall of the previous era, the Scarlet-Eyed Youth returned to the Sacred Flames while the silent hero Yupan Kui fell to the ruler's flames. Whether or not these were two different things, I'm still not sure. Of the twins, only Waskar was left alive and was scarred from losing his elder brother, seemingly destroying his vocal cords after the event. The crownless crown in Unfinished Reverie is symbolic of the half-man king in his preeminence, as well as Natlan likely not having a proper ruler of their people. The craftsman also likely died to the beast's butcher's blade, but the most impactful was the loss of his legacy through his artisanship, leaving the young girl Sakuk to age into an old lady who procured forgeries to keep his craftsman companion's name clean. The importance of authentic craftsmanship is also highly regarded in Mesoamerican and African culture, as such trinkets are reserved for high status and those of the divines. Now, an uncrowned region is quite interesting for Natlan, implying that there isn't a true ruler at the moment, like Fontaine with Farina, but instead of a false archon, we have a pyro archon that is similar to Sakuk, a spokesperson for all the six tribes with no real official rule over Natlan, but acts for the best intentions and betterment of their region. Lastly, the odes and promises of the band of heroes, which every one of them held onto for each other's sake similar to a contract in Liyue, but in Natlan holds these as sacred pacts between companions. 
And with these pacts also lies the grand stories of their journey, which we've also noticed from every passage of Natland's lore, even from someone like Ranjit who only visited Natland. And there we go, my thoughts on the latest Natland artifact set, its implications for Natland's lore, design, story, and history. Seriously though, Natland does seem like the likely region of first impact and enactment of the primordial one's rule. The Genshin's impact. The first god's impact, you know. Humans that were condemned for freeing Saurians like Sakuk's father seems like a time where Saurians were not given freedoms like they do now, hinting at a time where dragons really were caged by humanity, or at least by Celestia, which again goes back to the primordial one and the ancient civilization right after the fall of the dragon lords. I mean, how else would you find an ineffable city if it wasn't created by the four shades? Now, this video is already long enough for my liking, so I'll see you guys in the next one, yeah? Like, comment, enjoyed, subscribe, and hit the bell for more of my ramblings, and stay mad theorists. Bye!